today. I'm just going to do a little bit of setting up, so I might grab that microphone and work through the... Thank you. Yashara Evans, Futurist and Chief Executive Officer for Market Clarity. And the session's topic, Cybercrime from Sci-Fi to Boardroom Threat, Where Will the Challenges Lie in the Digital Future? Shara is recognised as one of the world's top female futurists, fusing her engineering background with an intuitive understanding of how society is likely to respond to new technologies. She's also the founder and CEO of Market Clarity, an award-winning technology analyst firm and a regular media commentator on technology issues. Shara helps her clients understand new products and service opportunities as well as threats that are being underpinned by emerging technologies. She's passionate about helping organisations think outside the box of what's available today to imagine the world in five or ten years and to commercialise these concepts into new innovative products and services. Please welcome Shara. Thanks very much, Andrew, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Without a doubt, there are an amazing array of technologies that are coming online that are going to create a world 10 years from now that will seem like something out of a science fiction movie and in 20 years may be completely unrecognizable. Now, these technologies are going to open up a lot of opportunities for businesses. They're going to disrupt business as usual in many different industries as well. But along the way, they're also going to present new challenges for us in terms of security and privacy and enable new vectors for cyber criminals. And I'd like to talk to you a bit about that today and draw some analogies to science fiction. So let's start with the here and now. What is digital security like? Well, I would say that we are in a state of ongoing war. Every single day, if you read the tech journals, you find out about another hack. Yesterday, it was Gumtree. Who knows what it will be today? You know, if I go back and check the news, undoubtedly I'll find something new. At the current time, the biggest attack vector is still computers and networks. But coming up behind that are our smartphones. We have applications like flashlights that track our every movement. We've got all kinds of malware, especially on the Android platform. There are about 300 clones of a game called Flappy Birds that give people root access to smartphones. And from that, you can get any kind of information, including banking. Another one that has recently been in the news is the Trojan Ace card, and that one is really, really dangerous because what it does is it mimics well-known applications. For instance, it can look like a legitimate banking application. It can look like your legitimate Twitter application or many, many others. It's a bit of a war zone. And then we have this whole Internet of Things. In the enterprise space, one of the areas that more and more companies are looking at is what do wearables mean? And unfortunately, security tends to be an afterthought. Privacy tends to be an afterthought. And it impacts everybody's business. So what's hackable? Well, some of the scary ones that I've heard about include an oil rig. Hackers manage to get into an oil rig and tip it. Imagine if this was a container ship. These vessels are large. In fact, 90% of the international trade goes by sea. What if instead of an oil rig, you tipped a container ship? You'd probably be looking at about a billion dollars worth of damage. Another one that's a bit scary occurred in a steel mill where a worker just clicked on an attachment in an email and the hackers got right into it. So we're talking about molten metal. What could be done with that? Or how about airplanes? I'm sure most of you have flown and probably some of you fly on a weekly basis. Security researchers in the US, one in particular, have found that they can get to a plane's control systems by hacking into the entertainment set-top box. There's a guy in the US, Chris Roberts, who's managed to plug an ethernet cable into the set-top box and get into the thrust control system of the plane and actually made one engine tilt, which made the plane turn. What if it wasn't a white hat researcher? What if it was actually somebody that intended to cause a great deal of harm? This is just the tip of the iceberg. One that is particularly concerning to me 
is the Juniper hack. And this was disclosed in about December of last year. Juniper found in one of its routine code inspections that its source code had been compromised and embedded in the source code, hidden in a way that a routine inspection of the source wouldn't show it, was the admin password. So if you think about what Juniper does, and in these products in particular, it allowed admin access into firewalls. So this is the perimeter that's defending your enterprise. And it allowed hackers to decrypt conversations on the fly. It went unnoticed for about two years. And there's speculation as to where this came from. But how do you get to a source code? It's probably somebody on the inside. There's speculation that it might have been the NSA putting in a back door, or maybe it was another foreign agency, you know, another foreign government. And then we've had this big fight between Apple and the FBI, where the FBI wanted to get into a smartphone that allegedly belonged to one of the terrorists in an incident in the United States, San Ferdino. And they wanted Apple to essentially put in a back door into iOS to allow them to get it. It ended up in a lawsuit. Apple decided to fight. Eventually, the FBI backed down because they found a private security firm that was able to hack into it. There's not enough time to go into how they might have done it, but it's probably by cloning the flash drive inside the device. But this whole idea of putting in back doors is rather scary because once they're in the device, how do you control who can get access to it? You can't just limit it to law enforcement agents. Once it's there, the hackers will go and try to find it. And surprisingly, one of the people who came out and said, this is a really, really bad idea, don't do it, is a retired general who was the former head of the NSA and the CIA, and he said, this is actually a really, really bad idea. So if we look at television, we see this trend where we have all of these superhero types of shows, and not only do they have these amazing superpowers, on their team, they have a cadre of super hackers too. Geez, I wish I had Supergirl's powers, but wow, having her powers and a super hacker too, what could I do? And how much of what these hackers on television do is real and how much of it is just science fiction and for how long. So let's take one exploit. This is an episode from Supergirl where at the CEO of Catco, Cat Grant, media conglomerate, found that all of her personal emails were hacked and put online. And obviously, you know, there are things that can be embarrassing or perhaps even very, very bad publicity for a company. The board wanted her to take a step back which she did, but she was afraid that there might have actually been something even more damaging in there. But she suspected it was actually a board member that was trying to oust her. It turned out that she was right. Supergirl, with her super hearing, overheard the board member admitting it. And long story short, he ended up getting caught and Kat was still the CEO. But how easy is it to hack into an email? The answer is dead easy. All you need is the right credentials, somebody, let's say, with an email admin access, and they're in. They can get not only one person's personal email, but everybody in the company. Another one that we see in science fiction are USB sticks, where you, know, you have somebody that goes in and they want to break into an organization, and all they have to do is insert a USB into the drive. And next thing you know, without anybody clicking on anything, they're there. Real? Not real. Sadly, it's real especially on Windows. Mac OS isn't invulnerable, but so far I don't know of any that have actually happened on a Mac OS. These kinds of systems have been used to hack into all kinds of places. A nuclear power plant in Russia. A Russian astronaut brought a USB stick up to the space station and there was malware introduced. You know, moral of the story is, if you don't know where a USB came from and it's not in shrink wrap, you probably don't want to put it into a live system. You might want to put it into a sandbox and see what's there. 
And then there are the super hackers. In the world of science fiction, Arrow, you've got Felicity Smoke. You know, she can hack into anything. Nolan Ross on Revenge, doesn't matter what the system is. Smartphone, FBI database, you name it, they're in there. Are there people like this out there? Luckily, the answer is no. Uh, these kinds of exploits do take time. What is the biggest risk, though, for corporations? And I think it's data breaches, and in particular, identity theft and identity fraud and loss of reputation that goes along with it. Data breaches are really, really expensive, and per record cost are impacted by how regulated an industry is, because the more regulated an industry is, that impacts how much your reputation is damaged. To give you an idea on what this means, think about the target breach. 110 million records were compromised. Estimates are that this breach would have cost over a billion dollars. It costs the CEO his job, it costs the IT director his job as well, and in just one quarter, their revenue took a slam, 46% decline on income because of this kind of hack. If we're talking about something like the Ashley Madison breach, it actually gets even worse than that. There's not even the, just the direct cost. There's the reputation to the company and potential criminal charges. So with Ashley Madison, the CEO was turfed. The company is likely to go completely out of business. But moreover, they found that the company had been engaging in deceptive practices. They claimed to have had, you know, roughly an equal mix of men and women, and it turned out that only 15% of all the subscribers were women, and a lot of those profiles weren't active. Estimates that I've seen say that this hack will cost about 850 million, and the company's probably going to go bust. Another big deal was the Office of Personnel Management in the U.S., 21 million records. Now, this is the U.S. government agency that does the security vetting for people in high security occupations. The kind of information that they collect includes, you know, name, date, birthplace, your social security number, all the places that you've traveled, your family, you name it, as well as your fingerprints. Once your fingerprint is hacked, it's gone. You know, imagine never being able to use your fingerprint for touch ID on your phone without knowing that somebody else could compromise it. Or if you're a secret agent, your identity is blown forever. Once your life is out there, how do you get it back? So that's just today. What about emerging technologies? Well, I talked a little bit about wearables and we're starting to see a lot of companies that want to be able to use biometric data that is collected from different wearable devices to help them better understand what's happening in their workforce and manage, in many cases, safety. But in the future, we'll see other uses as well. For instance, there's a prototype of a flexible sensor that allows you to do molecular detection of chemicals in sweat we're going to start seeing smart clothing that has all kinds of sensors as well. So you can imagine in the not too distant future, you might have call centers where people are wearing certain clothing and you could monitor how well your staff is doing. Now, there are two dangers to putting wearables in your office. One is that it may be the security vulnerability that somebody goes from one system to another to another and eventually compromises your really valuable database. Another potential danger that you could have is that if someone is able to manipulate the big data and give false positives on things, you could end up making really important decisions based on wrong information. And in fact, that's pervasive through a lot of emerging technologies is manipulating big data. A technology that I'm really excited about is augmented reality. And a lot of people hear it in, about it in the consumer world, but in the workforce, it's going to have a big role as well. The picture here is a smart helmet from a company called Dacry. The helmet is a hard hat, but it also has multiple camera feeds. And what it allows a worker to do is to look out on a field of pipes and superimposed on it, see what's in those pipes and information relating to pressure or temperature or look in infrared view and be able to see what's hot or what's cold 
And there are tremendous business applications for using these kinds of technologies. But it's a big systems integration job. And what if the information that is being fed to the worker in the field is false information? What if that big data is corrupted? Where might those risks be? And you can imagine scenarios where turning a valve in the wrong direction could be a very, very bad thing. And then we have facial recognition. In our environment, we're seeing cameras all over the place. And most of you are probably familiar with systems like SmartGate, where you've got a picture and then it's recognizing your face and either pass or fails. Well, there's still, even with that kind of cooperative system, about a 20% failure rate. Technology now in facial recognition is getting so good that the cameras are able to detect faces in a crowd at an angle as people are moving. And in fact, there's a company in Queensland, Imagis Technology, that is doing software that does just that. But it gets crazier still because you don't even necessarily have to match a face. You can do emotion recognition as well. So imagine a billboard where you have a display and you want to see how consumers are reacting to a particular technology. You don't necessarily need to know who that consumer is, but you want to be able to quantify them into different kinds of categories. What is their age, their gender, you know, other characteristics. But what happens if a biometric database is hacked? You know, once your fingerprint is out there, you're not gonna grow a new finger or get another fingerprint. If a facial recognition database is compromised, how do you recover from that? Well, our faces change a little bit as we age, but unless you have plastic surgery, you're probably not gonna change your cheekbones or other major characteristics of your face. What if someone hacked into a database of criminals and inserted your picture instead of a mastermind criminal? How do you then go about refuting that wrong information? And gosh, what if an autonomous lethal weapon was using that information to target terrorists or you know, other people in the future and it's your face not a criminal's face. It gets kind of scary when you think about it. And there's false recognition. The bigger the database gets, especially with facial recognition, the more likelihood that there will be false positives. So what do you do about this? Well, there's a technology that I was just reading about a few weeks ago, brand new scientific paper, looking at brain prints. So it's not just a simple EEG. What they're doing here is using an EEG skull cap, but marrying it up with a series of visual images. And there are different parts of our brain, and as individuals, all of us have different emotional reactions to different pictures. And that gives us a very unique brain pin that in some of the early research is showing 100% accuracy. The best part about this kind of technology is that if this kind of database was compromised, you simply redo another brain print with a set of completely different images. So it's still in its infancy. You wouldn't want to be putting on a skull cap with EEG every time you want to do a security scan, but eventually this is going to get really tiny and there'll probably be consumer devices that allow us to do this. There's still a lot of learning to be done here. What happens to people as we age, have different experiences, do our brain prints change? You know, all of these things will be worked out, but maybe this is some hope for us. In science fiction, we often see nano devices where they're able to record everything that you say and do without you knowing it. These photos are from a Doctor Who episode where they were fighting a group of aliens called the Silence that were able to erase your memories. So they inserted these little nano things into hands and once you've done a recording, it glowed so that you knew that there was something you needed to know that it has made you forget. Will we see these things embedded into us? Hmm, maybe not. I think that what we'll really see is something like smart contacts. This is an example of a Google patent, still, again, early days. So you take this concept of augmented reality, you marry in camera technology and wireless communication. And in this particular patent, if you want to take a picture, you just blink twice really fast. But imagine you blink twice really fast to start filming. If somebody is wearing a technology like this, 
would you know that you're being recorded? This is probably the kind of technology that would be used to surreptitiously record the things that are happening, maybe in a board meeting, maybe you know, as you're sitting somewhere listening to someone at the next table. Who knows how this is going to evolve in the future? And one of the reasons that people will take up this technology is that it's combining biotech with ICT. So not only will you have these communications capabilities, but it will do things like autofocus your vision, depending on what you're looking at, or be able to detect precancerous scenarios based on the chemicals in your blood. And the bits that are opaque now will be transparent by the time something like this comes to market, probably made out of graphene. So with all these cameras, including in people's eyes, what are you gonna do? What if you don't wanna be filmed? In the future, might you have an invisibility shield? Well, this is a paper that was published just um, a few months ago, and scientists at Iowa U University have developed this meta material, you know, part of the material sciences area, where they're able to use this liquid metal alloy in little tiny rings spread out over a material, and they're bendable and tunable. Today, they're able to block radar signatures at a range of frequencies. But what the scientists want to be able to do with this technology is to make it smaller and smaller and smaller and be able to extend the capabilities of blocking infrared and visible light. So can you imagine a future scenario where these little devices are embedded in your clothing? And if you're a woman, maybe in your makeup, or even a man in your makeup, and suddenly you're rendered invisible maybe to cameras or to people who are looking at you. There's some pretty interesting stuff happening in the world of science. We have to examine our cities of the future as well. And there's going to be an array of amazing technologies that are available to us. And there's always good points and bad when it comes to the world of the future. So one of the big pushes is smart cities. And in smart cities, the push is to be able to attach everything to the internet of things. And here, what we're talking about are all kinds of sensors, as well as all kinds of controllers. So sensors might be able to tell you where the nearest parking space is in all the garages in a city that happen to be located near the meeting space that you want to go to and guide you there at a price point that you want to pay. They may be embedded in building management systems and depending on the temperature, they'll turn the heat on and off. They'll raise the window shades or may be deployed by a council to be able to look at refuse levels in a trash can and only deploy trash cans when there's something to pick up. But how could all of this pan out in the future? Where's the danger? So let me show you, share with you a scenario written by an American author by the name of Brian Prophet. And it takes place in New York City several years from now on a hot summer morning. For those of you who haven't been to New York, Manhattan is an island and it's connected by a series of tunnels and bridges. One of the tunnels is the Holland Tunnel and it's about a mile and a half long. In that tunnel are 84 massive fans that churn the air through the tunnel every 90 seconds. On this hot summer morning, all of the fans stop working. None of the alarm systems go off. Within a few minutes, drivers start to get woozy from carbon monoxide. They start slamming into guardrails, into walls, and into each other. Before you know it, there is a massive pileup and fires. But it's not just in the Manhattan Tunnel. It's actually in all the tunnels. And on the bridges, something else is going on. Suddenly we see the latest cars with tires that start to blow out, that suddenly accelerate when you're not expecting it, that suddenly brake when you're not expecting it, or the brakes completely fail. And it's not just New York City. 
it's happening all up and down the East Coast, and it's not just the roadways. In data centers, for some reason, unexplained, all the cooling goes off. <laughs> the techos try to get it back online, and it won't go back online. They're forced to shut down all kinds of servers, including servers that run critical information systems. Then we find that alarms are going off, both in businesses and residences. It starts to overwhelm emergency response systems, and it's happening all over the East Coast. This is a cyber attack. Could it happen? And the answer is, we hope it doesn't happen, but when security ends up being an afterthought in all of these things that we deploy, it could be because the cyber criminals will use whatever vulnerability there is in our systems as the wedge to getting to something else. We've already seen it with big data breaches and with other hacks. Why wouldn't it happen when we're connecting our cities as giant nerve centers? The more we interconnect it, you know, the greater the functionality to us, but the greater the danger. If I look at cities, we can't help but also look at the kinds of cars that are going to be in cities. And I'm talking about driverless cars. Well, you don't even need to get to driverless cars for there to be danger from hackers. Professor at QUT, who heads up their Center for Automotive Research and Safety, did a study about a year and a half ago, and what they found was that the CAN bus, the system that controls the microprocessors in your car, is extremely vulnerable. And in fact, in today's cars, not even the driverless cars, security is practically non-existent. And hackers can get into it either through a direct plug or increasingly through wireless communications. So what happens as we start to introduce more and more driverless vehicles on our roadway? Well, we're likely to see cars that communicate with each other. We're likely to see citywide traffic management systems that are signaling to cars which way to go around traffic congestion that might be um, signaling speed limits and traffic light conditions and all sorts of other things. What if a traffic management system were compromised and somebody changed the speed limit on all of these smart speed limit signs to instead of going, say, 40 kilometers an hour because it's a pedestrian zone to maybe 70 kilometers an hour. You know, what would the car do? What's the decision hierarchy? Has anybody even thought about these kinds of hacking victors? And they will be exploited, no doubt. From a company perspective, what does this mean? Well, if your company's in the automotive business, then you might be held liable for any sort of defect in the system that you've deployed. If your company is involved in the systems integration for traffic management, you might find that you're implicated as well. There are lots of risk vectors here that are not just bad for society and for individuals who might be in those vehicles or around them, but for the companies involved in deploying them too. And it's not just cars that we're going to see in our future cities that are automated. We're going to see more and more robots in our environment. And just about a month ago, Domino's did this um, announcement of a really cool innovation, Drew, their little delivery bot, which they're trialing up in Brisbane, and it's actually starting to feature on some of their television commercials. Now, Drew has two compartments, one hot, one cold, and it's semi-autonomous right now, so there's still a human in the loop, but eventually the goal is for this device and others like it to be completely autonomous, and you need a passcode, which you get when you order the pizza, and you open it up. But what happens if a system like that is hacked into? Well, if you're carrying pizzas and somebody springs the lock, well, you know, even if you have a thousand of them, you might be out several thousand pizzas. What's that going to do, you know, bottom line? Probably not much damage. But what if it's not a pizza delivery bot? What if it's delivering something that's much higher value? What would the damage be if many of them were compromised? But it could get worse. What if someone were able to hack into the traffic control system that controls these and suddenly 
the sensors on the bot, when it detects a pedestrian, instead of stopping and avoiding the pedestrian, is instructed to run that pedestrian over. Or a little bot, you know, whether it's like this or some other robot, is told to go into traffic. You know, there are a lot of liabilities that could occur with this kind of technology if there's a security vulnerability. And that's why it's so important that security has to be put into the design mix and scenarios need to be tested. But it's not just our ground bots and ground cars that might be compromised. We're starting to see more and more applications for flying robot technology, drones. We will be seeing cities in this, I'm sorry, drone highways in the skies in our cities over the coming years. Drones are being deployed for all kinds of purposes, whether it be for videography, for package delivery, for inspecting assets, for providing faster ambulance response services, for doing all kinds of applications. But what if these networks are hacked? As with ground vehicles, there'll be vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications that occur between the drones and a traffic management system. What if that system is compromised? You know, here we're talking about devices that may weigh 25 kilograms or more falling from the sky. You might be liable for people's health, well-being, property, and you may not even have to hack into the system. Some Korean researchers have recently shown a device that uses sound to disrupt the gyroscopes inside drones and in some cases has caused drones to just fail. So, you know, there are lots of different areas. Now, video is one of the areas that is bound to impact a lot of security and privacy. There are drones that are equipped with infrared surveillance that are able to do things like detect footfalls on a carpet. But some of these drones are getting smaller and smaller, even insect size. One that I've shown here is a picture from the Air Force from 2014, and it looks like a little tiny bug. Imagine that you have a boardroom meeting and you've got a library in the boardroom and you've got something like this perched on the edge of books and it's recording everything that you're saying. What kind of damage could be done if everything that you're saying in a very private conversation is recorded? Could the stock market be manipulated? Could it impact the outcome of mergers and acquisitions? And how would you even know that it's there? And what if it's cloaked in this invisibility material? Not only would it be absolutely tiny, but you might not be able to see it with your naked eye. The technologies that are coming out right now are getting sort of scarier and cooler at the same time, but they're preventing more and more potential vectors where someone can attack the integrity of our companies and our personal lives. So think about the information that people put onto social media. You know, if you think about Facebook and the things that people post about their personal lives, I am just constantly amazed when people will post a picture of their brand new TV system and then a week later say, oh, and we're going on this grand holiday to Greece. They might as well hang out a sign that says, please come and rob me. But it's more pervasive than that. You know, if you think about just the information that you share for the use of free apps, and I'll just pick on Google for a moment, you might be using Gmail, you might be using Google Docs, it knows your calendar, your contacts, all sorts of information. If this information were compromised, what kind of nefarious purposes could a cyber criminal use this for? Well, one of the ways that hacks happen is through social engineering. And frankly, the more information that you have out there as an employee of a company and as an individual, the greater the likelihood that somebody could use that information to social engineer their way into your circle. And in fact, that's where a lot of the hacks come from. It's not just necessarily people that are deploying malware. They get the malware in there through social engineering. In the future, where is this going to go? 
Well, if I look at the transhumanist movement and the cryonics movement, which is looking at life extension and being able to never die, there's two things that they're looking to do. The long-term goal is to be able to take your personality and all the knowledge that you have and upload it into some sort of digital replica, whether it be a computer system or maybe a robot and at some stage maybe a biological clone. In the short term, what they are doing is compiling mind files through information that you put out in social media as well as things that you supply. So the short-term goal is to be able to create a simulated personality so that after you die, you can continue to interact with your family, your friends, your colleagues, continue your life work. There's already been an experiment, a robot called Vena 48, which is pictured up towards the middle, which uses a real woman, Vina Rothblatt, and they've created a mind file of her personality, matched it with artificial intelligence, and a robot that's like a robot bust. And people are able to interact with her, and in many ways she reacts just like the real Vina does, and Vina is very much alive. In the world of science fiction, there was a recent episode of the show Limitless that drew upon this kind of technology. A woman, um, this lady here who's pictured as a robot, was murdered and she was part of a project that was looking to create these mind file avatars and they ended up finding out who her murderer was by querying her digital avatar that was based on her mind file. So this is stuff that's really happening. You know, how long will it be until we can upload our personality? Well, who knows? Will it really be us? Will it have our consciousness? Well, that's another big debate too. But what could criminals do with that kind of information about you or about a corporate executive or about someone in a position of authority? How might that be abused? Well, a lot of cybercrime is very much tied around identity theft. One of the most iconic films of this genre is Face Off. And in this film, we had an FBI agent played by Nick Cage who had extensive facial surgery so that he could look like a master terrorist and infiltrate what they were trying to do. In a twist on that, John Travolta, the terrorist, also had surgery and pretended to be the FBI agent. So face transplants, are they real? Well, they're not quite Hollywood-like, but they're actually happening. They've been happening for a number of years. And late last year, a firefighter who was horrifically injured a number of years ago had the most extensive face transplant ever, where the whole face and scalp of this bike mechanic who had been killed were transplanted onto this burn victim and it completely has changed his life. Now the pictures, I've gone to show you some pictures, but they're really quite disturbing, so I decided not to do that. But where is this going? You know, would you have to resort to plastic surgery to do this kind of identity impersonation? And the answer is no, not necessarily, not in the future. We're starting to build some technologies that would allow this kind of impersonation to happen without plastic surgery. The first is 3D imaging and 3D printing. Already, the facial images that can be scanned through the 3D imaging technologies are good enough that Barack Obama was scanned and his bust, 3D printed, is sitting in the National Portrait Gallery in the Smithsonian Institute. The people who were involved in this project were under very, very tight security, and the CAD file is under lock and key because it has the president's exact dimensions. So that's the start. Then we get into a technology called bioprinting, where we're printing real space. It's the audience. stuff of science fiction, but experts say that in a few decades, scientists may be able to replicate human organs. A method called bioprinting uses real cells that can be put in a special printer cartridge to produce living tissue. But for all its medical benefits, the area might hold some future threats as well. As RT's Marina Portnara now explains.
major universities, corporate laboratories, and biomedical engineers are printing experimental heart valves, knee cartilages, bone implants, kidney cells, and even healing tissue. Now, 3D bioprinting essentially squirts ink of living cells to build up tissue structure. Eventually, biomedical engineers hope to print out tailored tissue suitable for surgery and entire organs that can be used in transplants. Uh, experts say that ideally they would like to uh, create organs for uh, those that are on lists waiting for organs uh, in, and possibly, you know, in, in life uh, circumstances, in dire life circumstances. So pioneers of this bioprinting believe it will be a huge benefit to, to the public and to the medical community. So I could essentially use photographs of you and then create a 3D image of you, which is quite scary because this, with this 3D printing, uh, it, we don't know how far it will go. And this is not science fiction. Need you think it is? They are already printing skin for skin grafts. They are printing bionic ears that give people a better range of hearing than their natural ear. In the U.S., a company called Organovo is printing liver tissue that has been approved by the FDA for drug test of new liver uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. It's starting to happen. Imagine that you've got a 3D bust of someone and now you can print skin on top of it. What ways could you use that kind of image to infiltrate a secure environment? Well, it gets even better than that. Researchers just recently announced a robot hand that is very, very close to a human hand in terms of its ability to grasp very fine objects like rolls of tape and CDs. And what they did was they scanned a hand of a cadaver to create these false you know, robot hands. And they're able to control it right now with a glove where you know somebody is doing something in the glove and the robot hand does the same exact thing. So technologies like this could be used to, let's say, uh, manipulate the outside environment of a space station. But the researchers want to go much, much further. What they want to do is to be able to grow tendons on these robots and grow skin and eventually graft it to people who might have lost an arm or a leg and do this as a robot prosthetic that's covered with real skin and real tendons and is able to respond to nerve signals. And then we go even a little bit further still, and this is back in 2012, where researchers in Israel and France decided to do an experiment with controlling robots from a distance using functional MRI. So, you know, you've got a really big machine, and you're not going to do this in your home office, but they were able to control a robot over 2,000 miles. So, you might have seen movies like Bruce Willis's Surrogates, where people are actually actually living in their living room in daggy old clothes, but they have their own robots going about society and functioning for them. Or movies like Avatar, where it's not even a human, there's some other life form that are con being controlled. The technologies and building blocks to make this happen are starting to be put in place. And then we get to this whole concept of flesh-covered robots, and it's a staple of science fiction. Shows like The Terminator, well, I think you all know The Terminator, I'm not going to explain the plot on that one, or Battlestar Galactica, where humans infiltrated society, or even a newer show like Extant. Could these kinds of flesh-covered robots be in our environment at some stage, and could they imitate you or I? You put this together with mind file technology, and maybe they will. Luckily, we're probably looking at the year 2040 or beyond before these sorts of things might be in our environment. But as we look at the world of emerging technologies, this is this place that it's starting to go. And you can't really talk about robots and the future without talking about AI. And I won't dwell on it, but I will point to one potential danger. And that is that we are increasingly automating more and more functions, taking humans out of the loop. An example would be robo-advisors, which are doing automated wealth management. And they're reliant on the data that is driving their system. So what if someone was able to corrupt that data feed? 
could you find that there's all kinds of transactions that are being done automatically and it's not detected until it's too late? What might the implications be? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is an early area where AI is being deployed. But we're starting to see robo-advisors in the insurance field, in the legal field, in the journalist field, there are already robo-writers, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. One of the things you've really got to be careful of is that when you're reliant on big data, that the data itself is not being corrupted. You really do need to make sure that you've got the proper security measures here. And might the AI itself be corrupted? Well, I haven't seen examples of it, but maybe it could be in the future. Now, one last thing that's happening in the world of AI is that researchers in the US in IARPA, which is the intelligence um, cousin of DARPA, are starting to look at these big data sets and use them to be able to predict future cyber attacks. So one of the areas that they're looking to do is find out patterns where there might be denial of service or where there's a whole bunch of penetration attempts on different secure sites and take preemptive action. But could it go wrong? Once again, it depends on the data that's being fed into it and how robust that data is. And what if these predictions, you know, the intelligence driving this gets it wrong? Could we end up with something like the minority report where a character might find that they're being accused of a future crime, but really they weren't going to commit the crime. It was just the signs that were pointing towards it. We're in for a pretty wild ride into the future. And the one message that I would leave you with is this, and that is we can no longer afford to have security as an afterthought, to have privacy as an afterthought, and to have ethics completely missing in action. We've really got to design this into our systems and consider this as we start to change our companies and our individual habits. The future is not written. It's up to us to make the world the world that we all want to live in. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Um, so I understand we're talking about security, so it has to be like this, but it's quite a dystopian world view of the future. Do you have an alternate view of more a utopian view? Oh, well, look, I can paint dark. either view. Um, this was a particular talk on future cybercrime, but I do think that no matter which way we go, we must build in security into our devices and into our systems. And you know, so often right now, I find it's just an afterthought, and that scares me. And part of the reason I talk about these things is so that the people that are designing these systems can actually say, hey, we need to do this. Uh, you talked in detail about data breaches for companies, uh, mm -hmm. identity theft, but if you look at uh, the real risks which are being faced by every corporation on a daily basis, mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at FBI, Carnegie Mellon, which says that the insider authorized staff yeah. are the actual people who are stealing it. I mean, uh, leave the insects in boardrooms, yeah. the board people <laughs> themselves. So, uh, and, and if you, you just have to look at last year, Blue Scope Steel, uh, IT manager just walking off with the entire authorized information or the uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So, what's your view about that? People um, will always be a leak a weak link when there's money involved or whether there's personal glory involved. You know, whether it be from cyber criminals who coerce them to do something or they do it just for their own glory edification or to line their back pockets. You know, part of the danger that I see is with social engineering and in particular manipulating information about a person, you may be able to blackmail more and more people into doing things that they wouldn't necessarily do of their own accord. And I think the message is that we just need to be vigilant. It's not just the security systems and the hackers. You're absolutely right. We need to really look at how robust our own procedures are and could one person have access to something that he or she shouldn't have and what the damage might be. It's really about a full 360 risk analysis. 
Do we have our last question? Hi, Alex Zaharovroid from ity.com. We have this push in society towards uh, the cashless society with the cash is king. Governments seem to want to get rid of it. And uh, obviously one of the big criminal things there would be to hack into all sorts of electronic payment systems and to create fake cash. How are we going to protect our systems and protect the concept of money if we can't trust it because it's being continuously hacked? And Alex, I'd go even further than that. It's not just cash. If you start looking at this whole blockchain phenomenon, um, there are lots of moves underway to use this same technology that underlies cryptocurrency to be able to do things like stock transactions, to be able to do trades on things like diamonds and other pieces of artwork. You know, how do we prevent it? I think we, first of all, do need good, strong cryptography. But, you know, as I mentioned before, we really do need to do thorough risk analysis around not just the technical stuff, but how we make this information available to trusted people in our organization and in our partner organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Shara for her presentation this afternoon. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. That concludes this afternoon's session. We've covered a lot of territory. Um, Graham with Enterprise Mobility, looking at apps in, um, and personal apps in the enterprise environment, things like security. Um, I always thought my, oh, I'm a big fan of biometrics, so I always thought my own personal risk was my children using my thumb on the smartphone while I was asleep. Shara's presentations really opened my eyes to a whole lot of um, new things. And obviously what Domain Group are doing at William Hill, um, creating an environment for the digital consumer is market leading. So I'm sure there's some takeaways for all of us. Hope to see you back again tomorrow and thanks once again for attending.